Welcome back to the G3 Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Weiss. And as we continue to progress through 2021, and as we look at the remaining part of this year, we want to remind all of you to be making your plans for the upcoming G3 Conference, which will be in Atlanta. And that's going to be September the 30th through October the 2nd. And you can find out more information at g3men.org. It's going to be a wonderful time as we come together. And really, it serves as, in many ways, a a family reunion for those who have been coming to the G3 for uh, so many years, coming back, seeing the, the same friends and fellowshipping around the conference center and being able to share meals together and to not only engage in that that Christian koinonia, but also that opportunity to engage in uh, wonderful, rich worship through the singing of the gospel and, of course, the preaching of the word and the teaching of the word throughout that weekend. So we hope that you'll make your plans to join us. We're looking forward to unpacking the doctrine of Christ, and that'll be coming up this fall. Now, today we have a very important subject that we're going to be talking about, and it's the topic of the church. As we think about the church, it's really God's plan for the the Christian. Uh, God has not planned for the Christian to just journey onward uh, to the celestial city alone. Uh, He has not planned for us to just be lone rangers doing our own thing. Uh, We're not on a spiritual journey all alone. And so God has planned from the very beginning that we would be a, a part of a community of believers that he has called the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the called out assembly. But as we think about the church, oftentimes what we see in our present culture is that families they they really orient themselves around cultural things like the football team or the baseball team or something else. And it's the church that really fades off into the background. The the mom and dad, they, they seem to teach the children to just put an emphasis on academics and put an emphasis on athletics, but don't really put an emphasis on the local church. But what we need to be mindful of is that the church should be central and that we should be orienting our lives around the local church and that our children should see that. It should be intentional. And when we think about the local church, we can't just keep the local church in the backdrop. It can't just be something that we do just on Sunday mornings only. And we have to be intentional about uh, being a part of the life of the church. Uh, we can't just have young people that grow up and think that they can just, you know, hang out at the coffee shop on Sunday morning and watch YouTube videos. If they go off to college, they need to be a part of a local church. And so our children need to be raised in such a way to know that the local church matters and the local church should be central in their own lives individually, and then, of course, as they have their own families in the days to come, that they should make the local church central. And one of the things that's at the very heart of G3 is this commitment to the local church. We believe that Christ died for His church. And so what we don't believe is that parachurch ministries should be central or that conferences should be central. We believe that we should be robustly committed to a local, tangible, visible New Testament church coming together, assembling for the purpose of service and worship, uh, holding one another accountable, encouraging one another, uh, using our spiritual gifts for the glory of Christ. And so we make that known at all of the conferences that we do. We try to encourage people to go back home, get into the trenches Sometimes those trenches are deep, sometimes they're messy, sometimes they're difficult, but that is exactly what God has called us to do. And we need to uh, consistently push back on this idea of church consumerism, and we need to be committed to a covenant relationship with a local body of believers, and we need to work together, serve together, love one another, forgive one another, and engage our communities with the gospel of King Jesus. Well, it is our privilege to welcome to the G3 podcast 
This week, Jeffrey Johnson, who serves as pastor of Grace Bible Church there in Conway, Arkansas. So welcome to the G3 podcast. Thanks, Josh, for having me on. This is a great privilege. Absolutely. Tell the listeners of G3, the audience of G3 podcast, just a little bit about your context of ministry, how long you've been serving there as pastor. Yeah, I've been pastoring at the same church, the first church I've ever pastored uh, for 21 years. So I got in the ministry fairly young. I felt called to the ministry at the age of 21. Uh, By the providence of God, I I was supposed to start pastoring a small church in my living room. Didn't really intend to start a church, but lo and behold, 21 years later, I'm still pastoring the same flock, and we've grown substantially. We've started a seminary, Grace Bible Theological Seminary, um, uh, in the state of Arkansas. And then also about 10 years ago, I started a publishing company called Free Grace Press. So I wear many hats, but try to stay busy pastoring and teaching at the seminary and working on publishing books and so forth. Yeah, that's a lot of responsibility. And as we think about the importance of all of these responsibilities that you juggle and that you seem to juggle so well, we're going to talk about today the subject of the church. And of course, that's at the heart of your ministry and your calling as a pastor. But as we think about this subject of the church, uh, again, as as believers, as Christians, we should keep the church as central to our uh, Christian lives. In in other words, our families should, should orient themselves around the life of the church. And there's a reason for that. There's a purpose for that. But let's begin this conversation about the church by just talking about what the church actually is. So just help us think through a, a good working definition of the church. Yeah, it's trying to define the church is kind of like trying to define God. You need to attempt to do so. But it's, it's, there's so much about the church. It's everywhere in the New Testament. And so as I begin to study this, it's like, what, what is the church? You can look at the various analogies of the church, like it's a body, the body of Christ. It's a building. It's a temple. Uh, not a physical building, of course, it's a spiritual building of, of people being brought together. But in the thing about what makes the church so important, and we're looking at its definition, Josh, we really can't separate uh, the definition of what the church is from what the church is meant to be doing. And in one sense, you can't separate the definition of the church from the definition of a Christian. So like, what what is the church? Well, we may need to step back and first ask, what is the Christian? Yeah. And a lot of people would say, what is a Christian? Well, he's a follower of Christ. Well, yes, but he's someone who's been uh, by grace through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, uh, through faith, which is a gift of, the, of God. He's been united spiritually into the person of Jesus Christ. And the life that he has is the life of Christ. So you really can't have a Christian independent or separate from Christ. Well, once you're united to Christ, uh, you're united to all who are in Christ. And so one of the marks of the Christian life is this unity that we have with, with Jesus Christ. Well, that's one of the marks of the church, unity with all of Christ's people. So unity is one of the essential characteristics of the church. But how do we have that unity? We have it through truth, faith, in the word of God. So you can't have the church, which the Bible calls the pillar and ground of truth. You can't have a church or a Christian without sound doctrine. There's certain essentials of the the faith, the basic gospel message of who Jesus is, what he's done for us in his death and resurrection, that is crucial to the Christian life and the church. So another mark of the the Christian, another mark of the church is truth. I, I would say a fancy way of saying that is verity, which is Latin word for truth. So you got unity, verity, and then there's one more, I think, essential mark that you have to have to have a church, and that's purity, holiness. We're saints. We've been called out of this world. That's one of the marks of a Christian. That's one of the marks of the church. So I kind of reduce the church, the marks of the church down to three, uh, uh, unity, verity, and purity. And then I, I put it in the book, um, like if here's my most concise definition of the church, when we put it in the local context of local assemblies, 
Um, if we add these three essential marks, unity, purity, and verity together, the church is the communion of the saints, consisting of Christ's unified and sanctified people who have committed themselves to upholding the truth through assembling together with their ordained leaders as they give themselves to worshiping God by preaching the word, observing the ordinances, and exercising discipline. That's my most concise definition of what the church is. Yeah, so you mentioned the book. So tell, uh, just explain for the next moment or so what you're referring to by the book. You've been involved with a project titled The Church, which involves both a book, study guide, and also a documentary on the church. Tell the G3 audience a little bit about that project. Yeah, about 10 years ago, our church was... um, uh, just getting started. I mean, it was ten. Our church was about ten years old, but I remember writing a little handbook for visitors to know what we're all about and what we do as a church and what's a church is to be doing. And uh, that uh, was a little book called "The Church: Why Bother," which it did that sold a lot. And in 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 a sense, it got in the hands of uh, one of your friends, Anthony Mathenia, and I think he really enjoyed it. And he was the board member, one of the board members of Media Grate. And he suggested to the board that they pursue a, a um, study on the church and use that little book kind of as the basis. They contacted me and that gave me an opportunity to give the uh, that, that church why I bother a new um, revision, which I did. It's now called the church, uh, the nature, authority, purpose, and worship, which ended up not only turned into a 12 week study, they decided to do the study in Europe, go across the, uh, the a lot of the uh, like Germany and France and England, and actually we ended up going into North Africa. And they said, if we're going to go and do this study in Europe, why don't we uh, do a documentary? So it turned into a documentary as well, which led for for me to write a whole new book for the documentary to be based on. So that's what we did about two years ago. Fantastic. Where can uh, people purchase this this book and this study and this documentary? Yeah, the best place to go is the mediagrate.com or .org uh, website. And um, right there be on the homepage, there'll be links to take you right to the, the store uh, to, yeah. to purchase it. Yeah. Fantastic. They could Google Jeffrey Johnson and the church and probably find it really easily as well. Now let's back up and talk about what you just said about the nature and and about the the definition of the church. So so based on what you're saying, obviously we have problems today when we think about the church. There are all sorts of issues. There there are people who believe that, you know, you can just be a part of the universal church because we can certainly state that the first mention of the word church in the New Testament was Jesus when he mentions that he's going to build his church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Now, the way that he employs the word church there is in the universal sense, obviously. He's not talking there about the local church in a specific city. But as we continue to roll through the New Testament, we see the word ecclesia or the word church used multiple times throughout the New Testament. And the primary usage is focused on the local. So you have, you know, you have Paul writing to churches, the church at Corinth, the church at Philippi, or the church at Ephesus. And some of those were circular letters that would have been read in in multiple cities and in, in, in multiple churches. But the idea that you can just be a part of the universal church and go to, you know, Starbucks or a local coffee house and sit there with your you know, your laptop and just watch YouTube and drink a latte on the Lord's Day is certainly not within the framework of what God would say is His plan and design for His believers in the context of the local church, correct? Yeah, correct. Not at all. There is a a very low view of the local church nowadays, and part of it is churches. Local churches have made themselves, uh, because they focus so much on a kind of a contemporary style of worship of entertainment based ministries that you can get entertainment anywhere and people realize that if this is what church is i really don't need it but that's not what church is uh, to begin with 
And the, what you brought up about the universal church and the local church, that is one of the most crucial uh, theological uh, distinction that we need to make, that there is a distinction between the universal and local church. They're not synonymous. But we also don't need to separate them to such an extent that you could have uh, one without the other. Um, wherever there is the universal church, it, it's going to be manifested in some local uh, local way. I mean, that the local church is nothing more than the universal church uh, made itself manifest. And that's why I linked what the church is with the, with the very definition of what a Christian is. I, I, I don't become a part of Christ through the local church, but once I'm a, a part of, of Christ, uh, it's the natural disposition, the natural inclination to find out other Christians and join myself to them. Uh, and one for to be obedient to the scriptures that tells me not to forsake the local assembling of myself together. So I'm, I'm commanded to go and search out other Christians to associate with, but also to understand the local church, you have to understand the nature of the Christian life can't be lived out as Christ has designed, independent of the local church. So how do I live my individual Christian life to, in the way that God has called me to live it? Well, I can't fulfill my own purpose as an individual Christian outside the local church. I have to carry out all the one another's. I have to be accountable to uh, the church body and to the elders. I have to be submissive to my pastors. I have to contribute and share my spiritual gifts, whatever my spiritual gifts are, for the benefit of not just my own self-consumption, but the benefit of God's people. I'm to love his bride as Christ loves the bride. And so I, how do I love Christ if I don't love the local church? And the thing about the local church has been, it is Christ who's instituted it and organized it and prescribed its office bearers its functions, its purpose, its duties. And so it's not its not for me to go, I don't want to go to church or I don't want to submit myself to a local congregation. No, I'm commanded to. And then it is Christ who uh, has commanded the church to function in the way it's uh, he spells out in the scriptures. Yeah, that's good. So when you when you hear people talk today and they say, well, you know, I can just attend church. I might attend one church in this city this week, and then I can attend another church in another city next week. I might be in one specific local church, you know, on the Lord's Day uh, for a month or two, and then I might just go on to some other place. What do you say to someone that yeah. says, I'm not really bound biblically to church membership? And where do we find church membership spelled out for us in the Bible? Yeah, yeah. Well, you got two questions there, and I'll take the second one first, that where is church membership found? You can't understand the whole New Testament without church membership. It's so it's it's so interwoven in all the pages of scriptures that it's it's implied. It's written to churches. Most of all of Paul's epistles are not written to individuals, but to local churches. And even some of the epistles that are written to individuals, it was written in the context of the local church issues. And so you can't understand the, 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 the nature of the New Testament uh, without understanding that this is written to local churches. It's, uh, it's just assumed. Uh, it's, it's assumed that if you're alive, you eat food. It's assumed that if you're a Christian, you go to church. Uh, that's, that's an automatic assumption that the New Testament makes. But it doesn't just leave it as an assumption. As I've already uh, talked about, it tells us to submit to our elders. It tells us to... Um, uh, not forsake the local assembling. And I, it, I've kind of already defined the, what the church is, but if I wanted to put another word to church, uh, and this is why you can't separate the church from church discipline. And I would, I would like to redefine church discipline and church membership under that one other word, accountability. And I think that's what God has given us the church is to hold us accountable, that we're accountable not just to our own self, but we're accountable to God's people. And God's people are there to verify my own faith. They're there to make sure through my baptism and the participation of the Lord's Supper that I'm walking with the Lord, that I'm not in uh, overt sin, unrepentant sin. So I have that accountability that they're verifying my faith. 
uh, in, in such a way. And I'm called to help verify my brothers and sisters' faith. So to make sure that they're walking as God has called. And, and that holds us accountable. And it's it's really a safeguard because it's one of God's major blessings and gifts that he's given us as Christians uh, for our own spiritual growth. Because I'll say, I'll add this. God made you and I deficient on purpose. He's given us gifts and strengths, but he didn't made us to be independent or complete. Obviously, we all need Christ who supplies everything to all of us, but he gives you maybe the gift of preaching, but you're not necessarily altogether as hospitable as someone else. Or some people are friendly or they have the ability to make people feel at home and welcome at the church. Other people are just prayer warriors. And we all need to seek to excel in all these gifts, but thankfully God has given us strengths and weaknesses so we're interdependent and we're needing, we need each other. And so this idea that, hey, I don't have to be an ac accountable to a local body who knows me and gets into my life and understands who I am, my strengths and weaknesses, and then I can't, that I'm not responsible to take my strengths and my spiritual gifts and use for the benefit of the whole is to really completely uh, not fully understand the New Testament in its context. When you touch on accountability, again, I think that that's critically important to uh, just seeing how God has arranged church membership from the very beginning. Because when Jesus talks about someone offending you and then, you know, you confronting that individual within the context of the community of Christ— and yet, if they persist in sin, eventually, he says, you need to tell it to the church. He doesn't say, tell it to the city. He doesn't say, tell it to their local community. He doesn't say, put it on social media. He says, then you tell it to the church. So for those who argue that there's no biblical mandate for church membership, that you are to be in a covenant responsibility with a body of people where you assemble and you worship with that that group of individuals and you serve with them and you hold one another accountable, it's clearly established that that's actually the design that God has from the very beginning with the local church. And then you see again, this idea of if they persist in sin, that you, you would excommunicate them. You would treat them as mm -hmm. a, a tax collector and a publican. You can go to first Corinthians and you can see where it says that you are to cast that one from the body you know, if that individual, because that individual needs to be turned over uh, to Satan for the destruction of their flesh so that ultimately their soul might be saved. Right, right. So the idea of accountability and telling it to the church, and then eventually in some instances, putting people outside of the church demonstrates that there are actual boundaries. People have to know who's in and who's not in. And, and especially the pastors who are serving and overseeing and trying to shepherd the flock. So, yeah, church membership is essential, and we should give ourselves to the membership of a, of a local church. That's right. Amen. Why is it that we should actually be putting a heavy priority upon the assembly of the church? So, in, in other words, if, if I'm going to be a member of my church, and I know that when I join this church and, and I enter into covenant relationship with this body, if they meet on Sunday evenings, then I should do my best to try to assemble with that body of Christ in the evenings, um, on Sunday evenings. And so when we, when we think about the assembly of the church, why is that important and why should we teach our children to put priority upon the assembly of the church? Yeah, I, I, put, in, I put one of the chapters on uh, what's the, one of the responsibilities of being a church member and one of the, the highest most important responsibilities. Like what am I supposed to do as a church member? Be in church, be in the assembly of the saints, be there when they open the doors. That's, that's priority number one, is to be a, a, actively involved. Uh, and I, I even think that the church, local church, should be the center of our schedules. We should rotate our whole life around the community of the church. A lot of people rotate their lives around the, the baseball games of their kids or uh, they have uh, this, these events, or maybe it's work. Everything rotates around that. But if 
we are followers of Christ and Christ is everything to us. He's our love. He's, he saved us from our sins. And all we want to do is live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to give him everything. Then we would want to go give ourselves to his word, his book. And then if we get into that book, it says, okay, Christ has created this institution. Not, not you or I, Josh, we didn't do this. He created this thing and he's organized it. And he says it needs elders. It needs uh, deacons. It has a membership, like you've talked about, a covenant membership. It has a, a uh, who's in and who's out. And then it tells that uh, group, this institution that he created, he designed, he outlined and mapped out. It tells that group what to do when it meets, how to do it. Well, if, if, if it's my Lord that's given the instructions, and if it's his church, and he's overseeing it, then it only makes sense that I give myself to it as it is Christ's church. That he, and, 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 he's, and then also in the scriptures, it tells me my responsibilities to the church. Then I want to be the best church member that I can. Uh, so for us to, to give our lives to other scheduling activities above the church is to actually to have, I think, some form of idol in our life that's it's competing with a higher priority. When we talk about leadership, you've mentioned elders, you've mentioned deacons. Uh, when we think about the leadership of the local church, oftentimes in Baptist circles in particular, you, you'll hear about a, a plurality of deacons but you oftentimes hear about a single pastor who's leading the entire church, and then he might have some pastoral staff, but but he's the pastor. He alone is the one who is shepherding the flock, and then these others are just assisting him in some capacity. And the deacons in a lot of Baptist uh, circles are the ones who are overseeing the admin responsibilities of the church and making various decisions. So we need to be thinking about what does God expect from a local church as it pertains to leadership? So should there be, and is it mandated that there be a plurality of deacons serving and a plurality of elders leading? And what does that look like? And why should we consider that to be extremely important as we're looking to join a local church? Yeah, I think that's one of the marks of a healthy church is having a healthy leadership or a plurality of elders and deacons. In fact, in the documentary, we I try to trace where did the Catholic Church come from? And I went back and looked at a little mistake was made by one of the early church fathers that knew the Apostle John, a man named Ignatius from Antioch. And one of the small little subtle mistakes he made was he put the kind of a the pastor above the elders. And he made a threefold office. You have a you have pastor, elders underneath, then deacons, which eventually over time led to kind of a hierarchical system of a bishop. And then that kept on leading and eventually the Pope come out of that. And it was a small little mistake that created a big, big mistake in the future. Well, later a, a guy named Cyprian says that the church is the bishops, the bishops of the church. And they, they made the church all about its leadership and it almost excluded the membership. So I want to come back and say, okay, uh, obviously you can have a church without elders because Paul would start a church. Then he would send Timothy to go set the things in order that was lacking, put in elders. Now they're a church. So we got to realize a church is the people, not its elders. So you can be a true church and not have the right leadership in place yet, but you're not functioning properly. And so we need to aspire to have a plurality of elders. So you may, like for our church, I was a single elder for several years out of necessity, but you're not functioning as God has designed. And that's why Paul says, set in order, put in order the things that are lacking and get a, a multiple plurality of elders in place. And it's only a safeguard for the church body I know that there is a tendency for for a for kind of a monarchical elder, a single elder, uh, to to uh, it, it can lead to abuse, spiritual abuse sometimes. 
but it's also a protection for the for the elders to have a plurality. Uh, I personally, on a side note, I love the fact that we have six elders in our church right now, and I love the fact that um, or five going on six, and uh, I like the fact that um, uh, I can go just when things go wrong, I can just point the fingers, <laughs> not point the fingers, but it's it's not just me that's made them the decision. And so it's a, it's a means of great safety for the church. Absolutely. When I came to serve the church that I pastor here on the west side of Atlanta, it was the church that I grew up in as a boy. My wife and I both grew up here as children, and then we were sent out from this church to go to study and prepare for ministry. And then I pastored out of state for about seven years and in God's providence was called back home to serve this local church. Well, one of the things that I was asked through the time of, you know, interview process and about nine months of praying and, and all of that before I was eventually called to serve as pastor here were what are some changes that you would make in the life of this church? One of the things that I listed from the very beginning was that I would lead this church, that I would lead this church to, uh, to, to embrace a, a leadership structure where we have a plurality of elders leading and a plurality of deacons serving and then working together these two offices within the church to serve and to care for this, this church. And then I, I promised, I said, I would not do this overnight. I would want to do this over a period of a few years of preaching and studying and demonstrating from the pages of Scripture that this is the biblical model. And so sure enough, you know, within about four years, we had a functioning uh, eldership, but it was something that I determined to do from the very beginning. So when I'm counseling people and they say, well, I'm going to be moving to such and such city or, or whatnot. Um, what are some things that you would say are, are a necessity before we actually join a local church in this specific town or city? And I usually tell them one of the things is a plurality of elders. And, and as to what you said a moment ago, it's possible to find a, a true church that, doesn't have a plurality of elders, but it's a different story if that church is, is stating that we have no plans to ever have a plurality of elders. And so that's a whole different, you know, scenario altogether. And so, uh, back to the initial conversation when we talked about church discipline, I I usually add that to the list as well, church discipline and a plurality of elders, and then the right administration of the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's table. Those are the three critical pillars. If you look historically uh, back through the theologians of church history, they would say these are the essential marks. You know, you need to have the right preaching of the word. You need to to have the right uh, administration of the ordinances and church discipline. And then all of this, again, coming with leadership structure that demonstrates that there is a plurality of elders who are caring for this body. And and that's essential. So if someone were asking you, what's a list of things that are absolutely necessary for me to join a church, what would you say? Yeah, I would, I would repeat those same things that you've said. I I would, uh, historically that's been what defines a good, healthy local body. I, 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 what I want to see in a church, a couple, in, in addition to that is you call it expository preaching, or at least just the pulpit ministry is central to the church where they're, they're expounding the word of God and they're being faithful to the word of God. And there is a fear of God in the pulpit ministry where it's about teaching God's word as God has laid it out rather than just helping people feel better about themselves or giving them uh, a, a motivational pep talk like we see uh, in so many churches today. So a robust uh, pulpit ministry is essential. Uh, but also often what's forgotten a lot, and it's not, it's sadly, it's not even in Mark Dever's nine marks of a healthy church. The, the thing that I think that it's so important to see in a healthy church is fellowship. It's, it's to me, it's going to be one of the barometers of what is the spiritual health of this church is not just 
how long do they talk about the football game? But what is the spiritual conversation like? And is there a robust uh, interaction and family atmosphere of fellowship before and after the services? Uh, you can tell a lot about the, <laughs> the health of the church by uh, how quick the church dismisses after the sermon's over. I've seen churches in five minutes, everybody's at the buffet. And our church, I like to brag about our church or just talk about the health of our church. It takes two hours to get out. And I, I used to be the last one to leave, but I can't outdo the fellowship. I can't last. I can't stay as long as I used to. Yeah, Christian fellowship, the idea of koinonia, that coming together with a, a depth of friendship and love that's rooted in the gospel is central to a healthy church. So let's talk a bit about consumerism. Consumerism is a plague, in my opinion, that's impacting local churches far and wide. And you mentioned the idea of you know entertainment earlier. Uh, if you find a church that's seeking to entertain people, first of all, they will never be able to compete with the level of entertainment that the world can offer. It, it will always look uh, cheesy and cheap and superficial uh, because the, the nature of the church is not that we are entertaining people, but that we are coming together as a body to worship God. And yet we find ourselves in an evangelical you know, saga, if you will, or a, a season of ultra consumerism. I was just scrolling through social media even this week, seeing people talking about, oh, if I could just get this type of music in my church. And then someone was commenting under it with a little, you know, statement, well, I know where you can find that, talking about their local church. And again, it's this idea of if you want a certain feel, if you want a certain type of music or if you want whatever it might be. And so then people are willing to uproot their families and move from church to church in their communities, sometimes only a mile separating the two buildings. And yet just simply because they can get a, a certain, you know, satisfaction related to that consumeristic idea. So talk to us about the danger of consumerism. Yeah, that's everywhere. And, and churches have, uh, have created that. It's like, which, who's the problem? Is it churches or it's, it's the consumerism of the people that they demand it? So churches supply what's in demand and everybody wants to build a church and grow a church. So it's just kind of like, uh, if I want to sell something, I need to find some people willing to buy. Uh, but I think what churches need to do and and is get away from like, I'm not trying to sell something. I'm trying to be faithful to the word of God. And if I'm looking for a church, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to find something that meets all my my personal preferences. I'm looking at what does the Bible say a church needs to be doing it, and how does a church need to be doing it? And that's that's what's going to be a church that that's the type of church that's going to be beneficial to my soul. And what happens? I think we're watching churches become more and more youth centered. Uh, like churches function today like big youth ministries because they have learned. In the 80s and 90s, you grow a church through attracting the, the kids and because parents want their kids to go to church, so they let the kids decide which church they go to. So they would create gyms and uh, all these things that kids like. That would drive the market. Now, the youth ministry with the music has become more appealing than the gym and having a, you know, a playground. So they've just integrated that into the main worship service where the main worship service used to look, that's what the youth ministry used to look like. And it's because that's how people decide which church to attend is where does my teenagers want to go? Um, rather is, is what is, what pleases God? It's not what pleases my kids uh, or what, you know, my wife may want is what, what is God? What is he pleased with? And, most importantly, it's it's a serious preached word. And the, the problem with growing a church, Josh, is that most of the people out there are not Christians. So we want to get non-Christians to come to something that non-Christians don't like. And that's to God. 
And they don't like God because God exposes their sins. God makes them feel guilty. And so somehow you've got to get non-believers to come to a, 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 a God that's holy. So you've got to make God who's holy that convicts them. You've got to somehow de-holy, uh, de-holy mize. I don't know if that's the ro- a word you want I can coin. But you have to make God secular. You have to take the fear of God out. You have to make God more like what they want. A God that's like a Santa Claus that wants to help them live their best life. And so that's what churches are doing. And it's, it's, just, it's drawing unbelievers in and it's helping unbelievers have a sense of spirituality without any conviction of sin or with most importantly, without any rejection of their sins and forsaking of their sins. And so it really doesn't do God any good. It, in fact, it's a, a shame disgraces God. It doesn't do sinners any good because it just eases over their conscience and helps them go to hell more comfortably. And, and so it's a tragedy in every way you look at it. We rather than say, okay, what do we need to do? We need to preach a holy God, which the world doesn't want. But only a holy God can change sinners uh, through repentance into saints. And that that's what we need. And And so hopefully that's churches that we're looking for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think one of the indictments on the the health of a local church today is when you look at their prayer meetings. You know, you, you see, you know, just a handful of people that have assembled to pray, which is what we're called to do as a church. And yet, if you were to, to announce that there's going to be some sort of festivity that afternoon instead of a prayer meeting, then the place would be packed because their kids want to come. There's something for the kids, uh, as you hear people say today. So again, as if prayer is not something for the children, and yet we expect to isolate them from prayer meetings and from the, the, you know, the, 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 the central aspect of what a church does by functionality, and then expect them to just poof into you know, some desire as an adult to want to pray and to want to do the things that they've been commissioned to do and, and called to do by God in the life of the church when for all of these years they haven't been doing those things because mom and dad stayed home and said, there's nothing for the kids this afternoon. So, yeah. And we wonder why they leave the church when they're 21 here. They, they grew up in a church that it's Sunday nights, just pizza night. Well, if that's all it is, then I don't see a big deal to miss pizza party. I can, I mean, that's not something it's essential to my life. I, it's cool if they have pizza and I get it, but if, if it, all it is is games and entertainment, then when, in the, when life gets busy, I, God's not going to hold me accountable if I don't go and watch the movie on Sunday evening with the, uh, with the church. But if it is the, a real serious-minded prayer meeting and, and, and it's been life-forming and life-changing and my whole life is saturated and I have to have it to, to be able to, to, to grow – with the Lord and to know the Lord. And if it's life to me, then don't take it away from me. Uh, you, you, that's why if you, if you give true food to God's people, they ha- they'll keep coming back because they have to have it. But when you give people, um, I don't know, junk food, I don't know what it is that people, the churches are giving people nowadays, but it's, it's not sustaining them and it's not satisfying. It helps them for five minutes and they get to the car and it's, it's gone and it doesn't change their lives. And no wonder they, um, they don't feel like they have to come back or have to be dedicated to a church like that. Yeah. Well, as we bring this conversation to a close, I want to talk about one last thing as we think about you know, the importance of a local church, the importance of fellowship, the importance of biblical preaching and, and, you know, a serious mindset when it comes to the ministry of a local church, biblical ecclesiology, all of this is, is, is extremely important. But as we think about the, the scenario that we find ourselves, we have people that are consistently reaching out to me through G3, and I'm sure that they've reached out to you uh, on occasion as well. But you know, sometimes you'll have people say, well, can you help me find a healthy church in my community? We have searched 
uh, far and wide, and we've visited all these churches, and, and it's just a train wreck. We can't find a healthy church within about two hours or more. So what should we do? Should we compromise and just join the church, although it's not biblical and it, it has no intention whatsoever to actually become biblical as far as the leadership, as far as the structure and the functionality of the church? Or should we consider maybe driving a long distance, sometimes even an hour? Or if it's even more than that, what should we do? Should we think about maybe moving, relocating? What would be the the counsel that you would give mm-hmm. to families that ask a question like that? Yeah, yeah. Good questions, and that's the type of question I get quite a bit. One, um, we have people in our church that drive two hours faithfully. for They've been doing this for three years, two hours every week to be a part of us. And they're not just coming on Sunday morning and not being a part of our life. They're, they're actually integrated into the very fabric of our church, and they're committed to us, and they drive a good long distance. Now, that's not advisable because the church is meant to be local as best as possible. So I would say find the best church as close to you as possible, but also would say that this is your, this is your spiritual life. This is not we're not talking about um, some your favorite restaurant where it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, I, I would I'd rather drive two hours to a good church. Honestly, uh, what kind of sacrifice is that in the big picture? Then then to um, uh, just go 20 minutes or 10 minutes and and, and not be fed because you, we we think two hours is a long way or an hour is a long way to drive but think about it in the days of christ they had to walk everywhere they went you're looking at a 30 minute 45 minute walk just to get with the saints and we're going to complain because of a 30 minute 45 minute car ride so we're we're kind of spoiled thinking that we need a church in five five minutes around us. It's just, that's probably not going to always happen. And it's good if it does happen, but also would say, if need be, I'd highly encourage you, as I would say, your church should be the center of your schedule. I'd highly encourage you to, if need be, to uh, research and find the best church you can and move, move, be a part of it. It's, it's, it. It's worth relocating. And it saddens me that so many will take a job quickly. They'll relocate for a job, which is okay. That's fine. Sometimes that happens. You have to do that. If you're in the military, on certain occasions, you just can't help but relocate because of your job. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that I would put a priority of a church above a job. And and rather than just relocating to a new community, then once you're there, start looking around and find that there's not much to, to be found. I would put your spiritual well-being of your family above that and make sure that wherever you move, that you knew that there was going to be a, a in reasonable distance, a good solid church to attend and be a part of and to join. Um, so that would be my counsel is to make it an active part. And then... Our church exists because we couldn't find a church and we started one. Uh, so there may be a place where don't just sit at home and listen to Paul Worsher videos. Um, if you're going to stay at home, then pray that God would form a Bible-believing church with all the office bearers, with a qualified with qualified leaders who are called to preach, I would I would make that a priority because we need more and more biblical churches everywhere. Amen. So good to talk about the importance of the church, the centrality of the church in the life of the believer. And so, uh, again, thank you for joining us for this edition of the G3 Podcast. Thanks, Josh, for having me on. I want to point you to our website, g 3 Men. Dot org. You will be able to find out more information about upcoming events, including the G3 National Conference this fall, as well as uh, expository preaching workshops. And you'll also be able to engage with the articles that are being released on a weekly basis from uh, a variety of different authors who are writing on issues related to the Christian life and the local church, which would be of great benefit to you. You can find out more information at our website, g3men.org.
www.thepodcastnetwork.org. You can also connect with us on social media and you can find us on Facebook and you can find us on Twitter and Instagram. You'll want to follow us so that you'll see the latest announcements as we release those related to upcoming speakers and uh, other events that are currently being planned. And you'll want to stay up to speed with the various different things that we have planned for both 2021 and 2022. So may God bless you. We'll see you again next week on the G3 Podcast.